Thank you, Brittany. Um, good morning, good day, and good evening, depending on where you are. Um, and thank you for joining uh, our presentation on trauma and resilience. We hope that uh, to add to your toolbox today and maybe even plant some seeds for understanding trauma uh, in your field of work. Uh, this presentation uh, is being um, was brought together by myself, David Shorey, and Marcus Fisher. Um, and so, Marcus, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself, and then I'll introduce myself. Thank you, David. Good morning, everybody. My name is Marcus Fisher, and I am the Assistant Youth Coordinator for the Youth in Action Holiness and Action Program. Um, this uh, presentation was made with compassion, love, and our expertise in the field. Great. Thanks, Marcus. And I'm David Shorey. I'm a program manager here at the Institute for Public Strategies, and I manage our East County San Diego program. So to, uh, next slide, please. Today's uh, discussion will cover a few areas to explore the parallels of caring for ourselves as we care for our communities. Alongside trauma and ACEs or adverse childhood experiences, we'll take you through some exercises to explore, to experience, practice, and build upon uh, your toolkit. Anyone can learn these techniques and apply them to managing stress at work, school, in teams, or by yourself. Next slide, please. So the Institute for Public Strategies is a public health nonprofit organization focusing on community health and healing. Various programs bring public health information to the community and activate them for a better tomorrow. We utilize what we call our ACT model, which is the approach to our achieving community transformation model. And you'll see there on the screen that we use a variety of things from media advocacy, community organizing, policy and systems change, sustainability, um, and data and research to, um, to be able to bring all those things together to uh, move forward in our programming. Next slide, please. So before we continue, we wanna just state that this presentation was created from a public health and education perspective. We're not mental health clinicians or providers, but that the information presented is current. Um, the pr information presented today is current, but it is ever changing. And to better help, um, and we're doing it to better help others understand the impact of ACEs and resilience. Trauma is complex. Not everyone has the same experience from its impact and everyone's story and the healing process will differ. ACEs or adverse childhood experiences are very common among the general population. And if this information does activate something for you, we want to encourage you to practice self-care. Take a break, get some water, attend to another task while we talk, or even turn off the presentation. We are gonna be recording this, we are recording this and you can come back to it at any point. And remember, we're all here to learn together. So please let us know if you would want to learn more about how your program can benefit from resilience training. And we can talk a little bit more about that towards the end of the um, presentation. With that said, uh, we welcome you to our presentation on trauma and resilience. I now want to turn it over to Marcus. Thank you, David. <clears throat> so for memories, memories help form our personalities. The first five years of a child's life uh, helps them understand the world around them, learning how to talk, eat, who their family is, but also how to function in the world around them. We've opened up a poll to see if anybody can tell us where this image came from. Uh, there's a couple of movies up on the screen. Uh, so if you know where this uh, picture came from, just select the, the, um, one of the answers in the poll and we'll see where everybody's at.
Yay. It looks like a lot of people watch Disney. <laughs> it's great. Yeah. So this is from the Disney Pixar movie Inside Out. Thank you, everybody who uh, who added their, added their answer. Each of these characters are a basic emotion um, that everybody has from left to right. Anger, uh, he makes sure that makes he makes sure that things are fair. Disgust, she checks to see if something is poisonous, like food or social situations. Joy is the emotion that helps find the fun and happiness in anything. Uh, next is fear, and fear makes sure that to basically protect us if something is dangerous. And lastly, sadness. Sadness helps us know when something is uncomfortable or unhappy. All of these emotions interact and work together to ensure Riley, the central character, is functioning properly, creating core memories that make up value systems and eventually creating behaviors and character. None of these emotions, whether anger or sadness, joy or fear, are actually considered good or bad. They all have their own function and our experiences and outside influences help give those labels good or bad. Depending on our experiences, they can also have an everlasting effect on our mind, body, and eventually our future. Next slide, please. And with that, I will bring this off to David. Thank you, Marcus. Um, one second here. Um, uh, my apologies. All right, we're going to talk about ACEs. Um, trauma can have a lasting impact on a person depending on the type, length, and recovery methods. The ACEs study was conducted by the Centers for Disease Control and Kaiser Permanente in the 1990s with a group of um, patients who were actually here in the San Diego area. The initial study uh, focused on how traumatic childhood events may negatively affect adult health. 17,000 participants were surveyed regarding their early life experiences and current health uh, status and behaviors. The ACE study found a direct link between childhood trauma and adult onset of chronic disease, incarceration, and employment challenges. In other words, the higher amount of trauma someone had uh, been a witness or a victim or a survivor too, the severity and type uh, uh, and type increased the chance of health challenges later on in life, such as heart disease, diabetes, depression, drug and alcohol use, suicidal ideation, and early death. Next slide, please. From the ACE study, uh, researchers were able to pinpoint that having a traumatic, significant traumatic event. Uh, happening in their early development had a significant impact on their life and later development into adulthood. Researchers were able to identify three categories. Abuse, which was physical, emotional, and sexual. Neglect, physical or social, emotional. And household dysfunction, family mental illness, domestic violence, divorce, incarceration, drug and alcohol use. 61% of those surveyed had five or more traumatic episodes before the age of 18. And of those reporting higher, the majority were women. A later study in 2019 was able to find that the environment that a patient grew up in, their zip code, economic status, risk of homelessness, discrimination, and lack of community resources, has a significant uh, connection to the development of ACEs. Not only do experiences contribute to a person's developmental health, but also the environment 
Here we can see that even experiences of discrimination, lack of stability, and social capital can wear on someone's growth. Next slide, please. <clears throat> now we wanna talk a little bit about positive childhood experience, um, which is a, also has an impact. Um, a further study with ACEs also led to the inclusion of positive childhood experiences. After conducting another study with patients with ACEs, data reflected that there were positive experiences as well that built resilience. For every ACE patient had, there's a counter experience that helped them through the tough times. <clears throat> and I think Marcus, you're gonna talk a little bit more about PACEs as well. Uh, yes, a little bit later. Uh, okay. Next slide, please. Cool, yeah. oh, so here is my part. So as I stated earlier, our memories and experiences shape our personalities. Trauma is complex and manifests in different ways for many people. As our culture grows to be more aware of mental health and self-care, many terms are used to help explain what a person is experiencing. This next section will actually explore how trauma affects the brain, learning ability, and building relationships. Next slide, please. Our brain absorbs information constantly from the day we're born until our final moments. The next three, uh, these three sections of the brain that we're gonna be talking about are the prefrontal cortex, the hippocampus, and the amygdala. Next section, please. All right, so the three, the three functions of the brain that actually do have a huge impact, especially when trauma is considered, um, are these three, the hippocampus, the amygdala, and the prefrontal cortex. Each of the sections have a huge function uh, depending on the experience, and also they play a part in reaction and recovery. The hippocampus uh, is our memory bank and learning bank. And our first memories and lessons are stored here to help <coughs> us either stop <coughs> or repeat certain behaviors. Uh, it's located at the towards the very base of the of the brain as well. And the amygdala is the next one. It's um, sort of like the neighbor to the hippocampus. It's the alarm system and sensory bank, which helps us feel, um, gives us those gut reactions or tingling sensations when something is about to happen. The third section is the prefrontal cortex, right um, where your forehead is at. This is our gauge for emotion and reactions and plays a huge uh, role in emotional development up until the age of 25. If the prefrontal cortex is ever damaged due to injury or some type of growth, sto um, growth stunt, excuse me, this can have a, lo a long lasting effect on a person's life. When we experience trauma, the amygdala can sometimes store the memories but block them due to overstimulation. The other parts of the brain will remember sensations and emotions, but we won't know why the feelings of certain situations will be stronger than the memory. Over time, if trauma, if more trauma occurs, the brain stores feelings, um, emotions, and eventually it helps elevate the blood pressure and uh, in a person's body, and also producing more cortisol, the hormone which helps us give uh, fight, flee, or freezing in a situation that could be dangerous to ourselves. Over time, the pump of adrenaline and, and cortisol will affect the production of organs, the brain, and the cardiovascular system. Next slide, please. So the amygdala's role also helps with um, reliving memories as well, uh, but can also hijack your day uh, with intrusive thoughts, especially if you have a traumatic background. When this happens, Memories can flood a person, releasing emotions and sensations of past traumatic events, re-traumatizing or confusing somebody about which events are happening now or have happened in the past. Safety and survival become the main priority. These episodes some people may experience are called triggers. This term has been misused in many platforms to express frustration and disagreement 
or actual triggers, triggering experiences can be debilitating to some people and may shut them in and down entirely. Triggers are complex as well as some of the memories or events reliving in those episodes. But sensation such as sound, smell, touch, even seeing um, specific things can activate those memories. Next slide, please. Trauma affects also how we learn and how we build relationships. When we're young, our families and friends are key figures in experiencing trust and love. Parents can teach us acceptance and also how to give and receive love. They're also the role models of expressing and regulating anger. Friends and playmates help build our confidence, encourage our likes, and may even, um, and also encourage our mischievous nature as children. When that trust is broken or traumatic events interrupt our lives, learning those skills of love, trust, affection, and empathy can be challenging for a parent or a peer. Trauma affects how we learn and grow. When a severe traumatic event affects the brain, many can have many people can have difficult uh, difficulty learning basic subjects in school or social interactions. If we look at our school system now, school districts recognize this and are doing their work to actually help students regulate their emotions while learning. IEPs or individual education plans are developed with parents and teachers to help students with their difficulty retaining information or regulating their emotions and reactions in class. But that is only one piece of the puzzle for the student. The rest depends on their ability um, and their recovery. Next slide. But wait, the brain can heal. So as much as there is all this information on trauma, there is uh, there's other data as well. Next slide, please. Positive childhood experiences. A further study with ACEs also led to the inclusion, the inclusion of PCEs or positive childhood experiences. After conducting another study with patients with traumatic experiences in childhood, data reflected that there were positive experiences that built resilience. For every ACE adverse childhood experience a patient had, there was a counter experience to help them build confidence and resilience. Next slide, please. In other words, there is hope in gaining resilience from ACEs. Healing begins in community, not isolation. Patients reported that their PCEs, or um, sometimes called PACEs, mostly involved having support from another family member or another adult in their community. The more positive engagement that someone had at a young age, the more likely they were able to find resilience. Next slide, please. As much as there is data and research for trauma itself, resilience has been the new kid in town to combat this information. Building coping skills and resilience work with people at any age can help improve their reaction to stress, decrease blood pressure, and help them process emotions that can be challenging. It's not a quick solution to an everlasting challenge. Building skills takes time and effort on the part of the survivor. Not all tools will work for everybody, but once we start to learn different ways of thinking, we can become different people. Resilience is the ability to recover or adjust for, to misfortune or abrupt change. Think of a situation you had where you had to slow your roll per se. When facing a challenge or something frustrating, whatever it may be, when taking a quick moment to breathe, collect your thoughts, feel the sensation in your bodies, checking in with your emotions, we can recover from intrusive thoughts and bring our true selves forward. The goal of resilience work is to add to the skills of what you already do every day. For instance, using focused breathing for one minute, only focusing on inhaling and exhaling, letting thoughts drift by like a movie screen. De-stressing by sitting, reading, or even watching um, something you enjoy can be very calming as well. Leaving a room with ecstatic energy for a, a couple of minutes and then coming back with a fresh perspective. 
The point is, is that you change your reactivity to something stimulating so that when you're faced with the same stimulation again, you have a better understanding of yourself and your potential. I would like to invite everybody right now just to take a moment to check in with yourself. Listen to what your body is telling you. Are you hungry? Are you still tired? Are you thirsty? Has an emotion come up during this presentation for you? What would you call it? How does it feel? Next, I would like to invite you to take a deep breath. Let go of any tension you may have. Start by inhaling on the count of three. One, two, three, hold. And exhale. Something like that is a very simple exercise that you can do any time to help um, regulate stress and decrease any other stressors that you may be experiencing throughout your day. When it comes to intrusive thoughts or emotions, we are in control of how we feel. Sometimes it may take a while to shake off uncomfortable feelings, but building, res building resilience, we learn to accept and understand what our brain and body is trying to tell us. A thought is just a thought. Emotions can indicate a need we have to acknowledge. Eventually, we adjust according to what those needs are. When you are doing resilience work, also go at the pace, go at your own pace and do what's right for you. Some people can benefit from meditating in a quiet space while others need to run a marathon to get something out of their system. Create something new, rich and wonderful for you. Next slide, please. Within resilience work, the brain is constantly learning uh, new things due to neuroplasticity. In other words, new experiences help us. Um, I'm sorry, excuse me. Doing different gives you different results. Try and recall the last time you overcame a challenge. At first, you may have felt that you were not able to overcome it for some reason, but somehow you did. What worked for you? How different are you from realizing that you are capable? But by growing new skills, we can decrease stress, cope with abrupt change, overcome personal challenges, develop stronger relationships, and see ourselves living in the moment. Next slide, please. On the aspect of trauma, when we are learning about our past and how we live our lives from those moments, please keep these things in mind. When it comes to trauma, what happened was in the past. You are in the here and now. We are all responsible for our future. And, and take one, taking one step forward towards our ideal self is just the beginning. It's not our fault for what happened in the past. There are people and situations that we are not able to, we were not able to control. We can still learn and grow to be healthier and more vibrant. Next slide, please. So for this section, uh, I do want to walk through a couple of exercises that we do practice uh, with the Mind Matters curriculum thing, um, but provided by the Dibble Institute. Uh, this is a curriculum that we practice with students within the program Youth in Action, Jóvenes en Acción, uh, to help regulate stress and also give them new tools uh, when they're facing adversity and things like that. Uh, so when, uh, these are very easy exercises that anybody can do. Uh, the first one is mindful breathing. Something, um, this is probably something that everybody has done before in a class or if anybody has an app on their phone that helps them do this. Mindful breathing helps you get perspective um, in many different situations. Taking that moment uh, between their next action uh, can be very, very uh, beneficial. For mindful breathing, what I would like you all to do, I invite you just to get comfortable in your seat. Maybe if you're slouching, maybe raise your, uh, sit up a little bit more, put your hands to your side or in your lap or anything like that. Start by taking three deep breaths. Inhaling, one, two, three, hold it. 
Exhale, one, two, three, four. The only thing you're doing is inhaling and ex exhaling effortlessly and easily. Take, um, take um, excuse me, begin taking another deep breath on the count of three. One, two, three. Hold it. Exhale. One, two, three, rest. Last deep breath. Counting of three. One, two, three. Inhale. Hold it. Exhale. One, two, three, and let go. I hope some people feel a little bit less tense with that. Mindful breathing uh, does take, it does take practice. It does, it is actually very effortless and easy. Um, but uh, over time, uh, we can, that could actually help with intrusive thoughts. If anybody is in a panic, panic situation, or if they're trying to gain perspective and find another solution to something. I would invite you to practice this at your own pace and time. Um, even with like your own uh, with music that you choose or if you need something to follow, um, there are many apps uh, out there right now that can actually help you with breathing as well. The next activity is a sensory uh, game. We call it five, four, three, two, one. And it's pretty amazing uh, and it can be done anywhere. It's usually done if someone is undergoing a panicking situation or having a panic attack. Um, or they're trying to calm down and settle from being very activated in a situation. Using your five senses is pretty much what you're doing. The first thing I would invite you to do is look for five different blue things around you. Is there a computer screen? Somebody wearing a blue sweater? Can you see the sky outside? Is there a blue car outside? Do you eat blueberries? Now, Listen for four separate sounds, like the computer monitor, are there neighbors outside? Is your stomach grumbling? Can you hear cars honking outside? Next, I would invite you to feel the temperature or texture of three different surfaces around you. Press into your seat, press the ground, down beneath you. Can you feel the, your clothes? Are you wearing something special? Are you wearing a uniform? Next, I invite you to pay attention to two different smells. Are you in a stuffy room and you need to open a window? Are you or a coworker wearing essential oils to help relax? Lastly, taste the last thing that you ate. Did you eat before this presentation? Are you still tasting that Starbucks coffee you had? And there you go. Five, um, five, four, three, two, one is a simple exercise seeing five different things, hearing four different things, feeling the texture of three separate things, smelling two different sensations, and tasting the last thing you ate. Um, over time, um, not just doing, uh, I would encourage folks if they were to practice this in a situation to do this over and over until um, either yourself or the person you're practicing this with is settled down. Um, it doesn't automatically happen when um, a, a person will automatically become after the, once they get to one, they may have to repeat it a couple of times. So if you're with another person in a panic situation, look for uh, specific colors um, or birds or sounds of cars and things like that. That way, um, repeating the um, distraction exercise, essentially, can um, help that person uh, regulate themselves. Next is a body scan. A body scan is good to identify tension in your body. So if you're sitting in your seat, uh, please put your hands to your sides or in your lap. Take one, just one deep breath. You can close your eyes or keep them leveled or a little bit open. Next, what I would like you to do is imagine a red spotlight or a scanning laser at the top of your head. 
Breathe slowly and deeply. See the scan slowly decrease from the top of your head to your shoulders, your chest, your arms, your stomach, your waist, your legs, knees, calves, ankles, the soles of your feet, and your toes. Take another deep breath and you can open your eyes, coming back to this space. Did you notice if there's any tension in your body? By taking a moment to check in with ourselves and our body, we may have to adjust our seat. Maybe our posture is off. Maybe we've been sitting down a little too long through the workday and we need to walk around. Maybe you're hungry. Maybe an emotion came up and your stomach fell or pitted. You know, maybe there's is there something you can do to help um, help yourself with that as well. Take a couple body scans uh, and see if there's any other tension or emotion stuck in your in your body as well, especially when you're experiencing um, any activation or any stress as well. Mem um, stress and trauma is also hidden inside the body. Sometimes we can remember um, the brush of a tree. If, when we were running or even being um, grabbed or held by the arm, things like that. The last exercise is coloring. So um, this is an exercise that anybody could do. Uh, we don't have any pages to give out to anybody, but coloring has become a huge industry within the last year, especially for adults. Uh, so some people may think, oh, it's only for kids that, you know, oh, I shouldn't be having this in the office. I'll just look weird or anything like that. Coloring actually calms the vagus nerve, not Las Vegas, uh, but the, the vagus nerve in the brain that helps regulate the flow of adrenaline from the brain to the other parts of the body. So adrenaline is the uh, basically helps us fight, flee, or freeze in stressful situations. When, um, when actually coloring, you actually start to de-stress and also regulate and slow down that production of adrenaline too. So even coloring into the lines of something, even painting, having a sketchbook or coloring in your toolbox or by your desk can be very, very helpful if you're trying to gain perspective of something or if you're needing to distress from the day, from a work meeting or presentation or things like that. So those are four exercises. There are many other techniques out there as well. These are just some that we're giving you as an example. So. And with that said, I would like to leave this off to David. Thanks, Marcus. So I guess one of the things we really want to emphasize is we are all works in prog progress. And, um, you know, we hope that you have uh, enjoyed and gained some knowledge from this presentation. And when growing new skills for uh, coping and resilience, know that practice makes perfect. Trauma is complex and, we, and will revisit us every once in a while. But as long as we keep tools active, we know how to respond um, the next time that we're challenged. Remember to find tools that best work for you. Some may need um, softer skills, while others may need more activity. And remember that growth can be uncomfortable. Just know that when we feel this in our healing process, it's a normal feeling. You can help stay accountable with your goals by involving others in your journey. Healing begins in the community not in isolation. And remember to seek further help, professional help, if there are more complex uh, challenges to your trauma. With that, um, I think we'd love to open it up to more questions. And um, uh, we have our contact information there if you'd like to reach out to us. Um, we've got 
plenty of time for, for questions and dialogue, and we'd love to engage with you on this. Thank you, David and Marcus, and we will be sure to drop their emails in the chat for everyone. Um, we do ask uh, if folks can take a quick minute. Um, so while you're you know, typing in any questions you might have into the Q&A, we have created a survey. We wanna get your feedback on this webinar and hear if there's any additional webinars in the future that you would like to see from IPS. Um, so feel free to scan the QR code or we'll also drop the link in the chat for the survey. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we will be, or we did record the pre presentation. And so we'll be sending that out to everyone and it'll be uploaded to our YouTube by the end of the week. Um, so yeah, we'll go ahead and see if we have any questions that come in and go from there. Well, while we're waiting for questions, um, I'll just say that, you know, um, this really does touch on the um, um, a lot of beginning aspects to this conversation. So we encourage you to explore resources that are out there. Um, there's the uh, NAMI, uh, National Association for Mental Illness, which has a lot of resources. Um, there's, um, you can check with your state and county public health organizations. I know that they also uh, connect with resources. And um, and yeah, so it looks like we might have a couple of questions. Yeah, so do you have any tips when trying to calm down a seven-year-old boy when they are very dysregulated? Uh, asking for a friend, probably. <laughs> um, Marcus, you've been working with youth um, recently. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. Uh, the first thing I would want to acknowledge first is that these are new experiences that they're having. Um, you know, so the regulating is also uh, something that we as adults need to model. Um, so, and we're all, we're, none of us are perfect, but, you know, Practicing these skills together with a child, with somebody younger, a child, a teenager, um, or even somebody in their twenties, you know, or thirties, depending on who you're with, you know, practicing and modeling them, you know, and then checking in with them, like, hey, does this work for you? Like, how do you feel up? You know, how do you feel when you've done this? You know, do you feel a little bit better? Or um, checking in the before, during, and after with any of these exercises is very helpful. And especially when you're working with younger children, um, it's important to also make sure that this is more like a game. Um, you know, like look for five different birds. You know, count how many birds are in the area. Listen for four things. Can you hear cars? Can you hear cars honking? Anything like that? Feel the ground. How rough is it? You know, can you stop it with your feet? Um, feeling. Oh, I'm sorry. That, Sorry, and then smelling. Can you smell uh, the fresh color, the fresh cut grass? And then, do you taste the cookie? Do you taste the snack that you had? Anything like that? Try to bring it back to their focus and something that would, um, be, you know, that they would actually remember or something that they experience as well too. Um, so that's that's from my perspective. So. Thank you, Marcus. Um, so we have another one going back to the positive childhood experiences. So would you say exploring positive childhood experience or PCEs with young people are more effective than ACEs? Hmm. I, I, would, I would say that um, both are important, that um, when you um, go through the process of, uh, and the, there's, there's an organization out there called PACES, um, I encourage you to, to look them up. They have a lot of resources on this as well. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, to understand the baseline of where youth are getting an understanding of their adverse childhood experiences is important. Um, also identifying the positive experience they've had is, is good as well, but you want to have both uh, to be able to understand the, the current condition and um 
you know, uh, where, where, what impacts these are having on, on folks, both young people and, um, and adults. Right. And, um, yeah, I, I definitely agree with David. Um, so uh, the reason why <clears throat> the reason why we also started off with um, asking folks about the Pixar um, inside out picture is because that's actually something that we use in the curriculum for Mind Matters uh, provided by the Dibble Institute. Um, because uh, it we it to acknowledge emotions are neither good or bad. They're basically just visitors that tell us what's going on and how we're experiencing things. Um, so uh, exploring things like that, um, as well to how anger can be an indicator for something we're experiencing, or sadness is uh, another experience. You know, neither of them are good or bad um, emotions. They play a role to help us heal or help us move through something. Um, and also, um, when it comes to facing, um, you know, our trauma in the past, right, and also building resilience, those are emotions. Um, that will come up as well too. Whether um, whether we're experiencing something very positive as well, you know, because there may be changes to something uh, that the young person maybe have to adapt to. There may be um, something that they will have to acknowledge or struggle with, because uh, they may not be able to process something um, at that time too. So, so I definitely think I definitely think, feel that both acknowledging paces and aces at the same time at a very at an even level can actually help people understand where they're at. Thanks, Marcus and David. Um, so going back to the beginning about emotions, I'm kind of jumping to this, this question since you just kind of touched on the inside out, Marcus, how can fear be beneficial for an individual? Mm. Well, uh, in the movie, fear helps us understand if something's dangerous. Um, so, uh, and it's, and you know, <laughs> talking about trauma and how it actually does <clears throat> affect the brain and produce cortisol and store memory and things like that. It's, it really reminds me of um, that the science fiction book and movie Dune. Fear is the mind killer in a way. So um, not literally, but, you know, in a way, if we don't face our fears, you know, if we don't understand why we're reacting to certain things, then um, well, we can't process moving forward. Uh, fear as an in fear and anger and sadness as an indicator of what we're going through um rather than um what i've what i've heard in, in many traditional spaces you know like you shouldn't be feeling that don't ex don't express that don't um you know don't be like that you know it's uh, if someone is actually scared or afraid you ask them why you know what is it that you need and how can i give it to you um that's what um i've been told by a mentor as well too um fear helps us in the, show like you know what are, we're also capable of too you know are we able to make our next step forward or do we need to stay back and actually um we collect ourselves create a new plan of action things like that so that's what i can say about that and and i would also add to that that you know there's a difference between rational fear and irrational fear so if you're in a circumstance um uh where you know you have a black widow run over your hand or you know you you hear a bump in the night you know um that may may sh shock you and and but if you're um having a circumstance where perhaps there's a, a condition that's causing you fear that um generally wouldn't cause fear then you know uh, we are products of of millennia of evolution and um you know there's always a reason for the, the the emotions that we have and as marcus was saying a lot of our society feels like oh we should suppress our emotions or not embrace our emotions but our emotions you know are those those um uh, for lack of a better term the the bumpers on the bowling alley you know it helps us kind of regulate what where we're going and what we're doing and how we're doing it and they're important um, so if, uh, I would encourage everyone, you know, we are not, uh, clinical psychological professionals here, but I would certainly encourage you to have a conversation with your mental health provider to talk about, um, the aspect of fear and other emotions, um, and talk about rational, irrational fears. Mm -hmm. 
And if I can piggyback on that, um, if you are a provider um, with youth, or if you have somebody in your life that is going through something like that, they're afraid of something, uh, or they have a constant fear of something, establishing safety and reinforcing safety. Um, for instance, saying, you know, like, you know, in this space right now, you know, like, can you tell me what's around you? Uh, how, what are you feeling right now? Is it in your stomach? Also, you know, you're safe, you're loved, you're smart, you know, you, you got this, you know, reinforcing those, um, those safety nets as well, too, or even those positive um, aspects of like what's going on in a situation can help somebody understand what they're going through as well. You just answered one of our other questions, Marcus. I don't know if that was okay. <laughs> or not, um, but I wanted to see if there's anything either of you wanted to add. The question was, how do you create a safe place for children to share their feelings and what are your techniques in doing so? Mm -hmm. Is there anything you wanted to add to that, Marcus or David? Yeah, um, I, I recently went and had an experience with another program, uh, camping. And uh, there was a couple of situations where um, some stuff came up of someone's traumatic past. And um, along with normalizing um, fear and anger and things like that, we, uh, establishing safety and also encouraging people, you know, like, we want you to be yourself. We want you to express yourself and know that, you know, this is a safe space. And even though something may feel uncomfortable, you don't have to go through this alone. Right. Um, you know, that that there are other people out here that do care for you, but also, um, you know, if you are not ready to share it, if you are not ready to express what's happening or um, you're not ready to come out, let's say, um, that's okay. You know, you are, you are in your own process. You know, you have the right to, you have the right to be where you're at right now and move forward when you want to as well. Right. I think also um, allowing uh, children to have their their feelings and go through that process. Um, often we want to make things better, right? We, um, as parents, we um, are, if our children sad, we want to make them happy. Um, if you know, if they're having a, a tantrum, we want to stop the tantrum and and give them something to to help placate that. Um, but all these experiences that you know youth are having, um, especially um, you know as as the, the brain is is evolving, um, is laying the foundation of of your your older self. So um, allowing folks to understand that emotions are good. Obviously, there's there's boundaries and 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 limitations in terms of how folks may express those and what what action comes out of those but having an understanding that you know okay you're you're you know, you're sad i want to just sit with you and let you have that that feeling i'm not going to try to um uh change you and, and make ma suddenly make you better i want to acknowledge the fact that you're sad and you're having that sad experience um and then having the conversation of how to move forward from that experience Thank you both. Um, so recognizing that we come at this topic as public health providers, um, not sure if you guys will have the answer to this question, but I know you guys have had experience at different levels, so I wanted to ask it. Are there any combined cognitive and physiological tests that you can run on people to measure their stress levels, you know, to get a baseline of how much general stress they feel and maybe aren't even aware of? Yeah, I can answer that. Um, so uh, in the Mind Matters curriculum provided by the Diplo Institute, uh, <laughs> there is a section that actually helps people understand emotions and uh, going through the basic five emotions and set out. Um, there are a couple charts that actually um, that a student will participate in and asks them, how often do you feel angry, you know, uh, anger, joy? When was the last time you felt those emotions? And when? Do, how do you think you will react to the next time that you experience that? If you go through exercises um, like that, um, also uh, the appropriate time or the last time when they've experienced that, um, that can actually, it, well, it, you can help the student actually understand um, how they process things, but also how they came, became resilient in situations of adversity. Yeah. And I would also add that, you know, definitely talking with your um, 
your mental health care provider or your physical health care provider about this as well. Um, I, I just want to emphasize, you know, we and I, I think it's becoming more common these days, but physical health and mental health are equal. They're both important in your everyday existence and they should be treated as important. So often we are uh, so focused on our physical health that we do a disservice to ourselves by um, pushing off our mental health. And um, mental health care is brave and strong and important um, and needed just as much as physical health care. Um, and um, we don't need to be heroes um, in trying to um, uh, outlast or, or overcome something that's both a physical or a mental health issue. Thank you, David. Um, so we do have someone asking for more examples and videos of the techniques that you shared, Marcus. So I'm hoping mm -hmm. that you can share those links with me um, at this webinar and we can just send that out with the, the slides um, and the recording so that people can have those tools to refer back to. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, especially for the breathing exercises, there's uh, many where you follow the dot on the screen and it tells you to inhale, hold, exhale, hold, inhale. You know, very, very helpful, especially if folks are um, visual learners. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna let's see where are we at with. There's a lot of wonderful questions coming in. I'm really there are. <laughs> think, yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm wondering if someone, so we have someone who's asking about container building and wondering, David, if you can speak on this a little bit and explain a little bit more about what container building is um, and the importance behind it. Um, I, I'm trying to... <laughs> It's a new uh, term. I have get the context I've... of if it's if it's like compartmentalizing or yeah, maybe we can get um, whoever yeah, not, asked I'm that not question for container to container building um, so much, but it, it sounds something very interesting. So please tell me more, and and we yeah. can um, try to get there. Yeah. So let's go to this one. Um, what suggestion do you have for starting the conversation and an exploration about ACES and their impact with those who may not realize? or even acknowledge the topic? Um, I think it depends on the the age. Also um, mentioning, I, mentioning, you know, like um, coming at things from an emotion-based um, process first. Um, you know, asking, you know, like how many of you been afraid or anything like that? How many, and actually going through those different um, emotions. Uh, um, even, um, we actually will do this game um, with the students that we have currently, um, everybody's seen an emoji. So we we actually went through like, okay, what does sadness look like? What is um, a sad emoji? What is a happy emoji? And then we asked everybody in the classroom, like, how does everyone feel right now? A lot of the students said tired and bored. So we're like, okay, what would what would tired or bored look like? So it's an exercise. It's something that they can identify with the emoji part, but it's also uh, for them to actually see you know like okay cool so i've actually felt this way many different times because we made the um, the, the this specific emoji but also helping them see the facial features of the emoji so um understanding and how emotions will and how they can process it first um versus uh, going straight into aces or anything like that because um and again you know uh we are not mental health providers but when we come to, when it comes to community health and community healing uh, we want to acknowledge the process of how people express things or internalize things as well too yeah and i would say also um check out the paces connection website because there's a, a link to the actual aces um um test <laughs> that that is available for you to go through and by going through that um from a personal view you can then utilize that to have a conversation with someone else. Hey, I realized that I didn't realize, or I didn't realize that I've had, you know, four or five uh, adverse child experiences growing up and how that affects, you know, my, my view on the world, my 
experience. And so um, talking from a personal perspective, I think always helps because people can, re if you can relate, someone relates to you, you can relate to them. Um, and it begins the conversation. Um, and I would encourage everyone to share more information about ad adverse and positive childhood experiences on your social media and conversations with friends. Um, you know, ask questions about it um, because this is something that uh, unfortunately often is under, uh, under the water of a lot of our, our, our everyday uh, interactions with folks. And the more we are able to have it as a part of the conversation, the more we are able to relate to each other. Yeah, and I see there are some folks asking for the link for the ACES test and we'll be sure to add that um, in the email that we send out after this. Um, I'm not sure if there's a PACES test yet, although that would be great to be able to quantify those positive experiences that children are having. Um, I know that PACES is, and resilience work is still really in its infancy, so if they haven't come out with it yet, I'm sure they will, but I'll definitely do some research before I send out that the webinar follow-up. David, do you, or Marcus, do you know of a PACES test? There's many different versions out there. So um, yeah. I would say, you know, the PACES website would be an excellent resource for now. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, and also just, uh, you know, because there are many test websites, I would probably go through there first. Uh, it's, you know, sourced, it's, ac it's a little bit more accurate. And it's also regional too. There are other PACES programs, depending where you live. Definitely. And so going back to the container question, I recognize we're at time, but I did want to just follow up with this. Um, from what I understand, a container technique can be used for trauma and you are supposed to imagine a closable container into which you put your less than ideal, ideal feelings. And so the idea is that by using your container, you are communicating to your body that you acknowledge those emotions and experiences and will come back to deal with them at a less mm -hmm. tumultuous time. Any thoughts or anything from you guys? I think that's that's a really good uh, that sounds like it sounds really cute uh, <clears throat> or a cute technique to actually utilize. <clears throat> um, I would say that if that's if that's doable, if that's something that can be practiced, any of these techniques, um, sh um, any of these techniques, even uh, the container technique, I would say, um, has to be regulated um, or not, not regulated, but practice often. Um, what if certain emotions don't want to go in that container? You know, what if um, you're having that emotion and it actually just like jumps out and you don't need to experience it right now. Um, that is perfectly fine. You know, I definitely think that um, any of these that you could actually utilize um, can be practiced, but over time, um, some things are actually, uh, can be very helpful and, and more powerful at the same time too. And I, I would, but I would say, don't, um, don't forget the containers. Um, you know, we, we often want to, Oh, I'll just set that aside and I'll get back to it. And then we don't get back to it. And um, you know what happens to a container that you leave in the refrigerator too long? Um, you don't want to open that up and have that, you know, smell and mold and all that kind of stuff come popping at, back at you more intensely. So um, remember what containers you put in or what you put in the containers and where you put in them and, 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 and get back to them sooner rather than later. Thank you. All right, so I recognize we're three minutes over the hour. And so I do wanna be mindful of our presenters time as well as all our participants who have stayed with us um, through this hour. So again, if you haven't taken the survey, I really encourage you to, this just helps to give us some feedback on how today went, but also helps to inform us for future webinars. Um, Again, the recording and all of the resources and tools will be shared out by the end of this week. Um, and then just a quick note that, you know, IPS does offer training and technical assistance in all of our core competencies. And so if you're interested, you can, uh, in learning more about that, what that could look like, you can email info at publicstrategies.org or myself, Brittany Hunsinger at bhunsinger at publicstrategies.org. So again, thank you so much, David and Marcus. Today's webinar has been amazing. I'm feeling really relaxed.